Hello again, and welcome to another episode. Today I have something very special in the mail. Someone wants me to try recovering the data from these old cartridges. These are SciQuest Spark discs. That's Spark with a Q. These are extremely obscure. This company, SciQuest, was around for a while in the 80s through the mid to late 90s. They made a series of these types of discs, never really gained a real foothold in the market, and went out of business eventually, but we'll come back to all that. So luckily, I was able to get a hold of a drive that should be able to read these cartridges. This is a Spark one gigabyte drive. I think one gigabyte was the only capacity that these ever had. And I was able to get this drive for pretty cheap, but unfortunately it didn't come with a power adapter. And of course it's got a proprietary power connector. It looks like some kind of den style connector there. So we'll have to see what to do about this. But before I do anything, I just want to talk briefly about what this technology is. Because all this is, is it's literally a hard drive without the platters in it. And this cartridge just contains a hard drive platter inside. So when we insert the cartridge in here, it becomes a complete hard drive. And SciQuest wasn't the only company that was doing this. The more popular brand you might remember was iOmega Jazz Drives. Here's a Jazz disc just for comparison. And this is literally using the same kind of technology. There's just a hard drive platter inside of this cartridge and you insert it into your drive and it becomes a complete hard drive. That's all this is. But you know, now that I'm feeling this, the uh, SciQuest disc feels quite a bit more flimsy than the Jazz disc. I don't know, something about the plastic feels cheaper or more thin. This has a metal shield over here. This has a plastic shield. I don't know, maybe I'm guessing SciQuest was trying to go for a lower price point, maybe cut a few corners here and there, made this thing cheaper, which makes me a little bit worried how these have held up over time, and uh, I hope we'll be able to get the data off of these. I feel like the 90s were just a golden age of these random companies trying to invent their own storage media, hoping it catches on, uh, and that includes this weird little period where we had these storage devices that were removable hard drive platters for some reason. But here's where we come to the problem with these types of disks. The problem is that there is a reason why a hard drive is very, very tightly sealed, okay? It's because if a single grain of dust gets in there and gets in between the platters and the reed head, it could cause a head crash, which is a catastrophic failure where the head digs into the platter, rips into the actual magnetic storage medium. That's permanent damage to your data, permanent damage to your drive, because the heads are no longer aligned properly. And that's it. And guess what? That's exactly what would happen with these types of disks. There would be little bits of dust that would randomly get into the drive because it's open to the outside. And eventually, the bit of dust would get in between the reed head and the platter. So these discs would fail all the time because of dust and debris getting in there. And what's even worse, because these discs are removable, if you have a bad drive and you don't realize it, and you put a good disc into it, it'll damage that disc. Or if you have a bad disc and put it into a good drive, it'll damage that drive. So you could just have a cascade of failures every which way. So this was a big reason why this technology didn't last very long and all these companies have long been out of business. So anyway, let's get back to my task at hand here. I'm going to cross all my fingers that these discs haven't failed and that this drive is still good and hopefully we'll be able to get the data off of these. So again, here's the drive and uh, it's got a parallel port connection. It lets you daisy chain to your printer, which was pretty standard for these types of things. And like I was saying, it's missing the power adapter, which I'm going to need to do something about. But it shouldn't be a problem because on the back it says input is 5 volts DC and 12 volts DC. You see that? 5 volts and 12 volts. Which tells me right away that this is basically using the same power as a regular PC power supply. In fact, I wonder if this is just an enclosure that passes the power through to a regular PC Molex connector that's actually in there. Let's just begin by taking this apart and see what's in there. 
Okay, well, it does look like the power connector is soldered right onto the PC board. And we can see parallel port connections there. So to power this thing on, I'm gonna to need to find the pinout of this connector. So be right back. Okay, I was able to find a photo on the web of the power adapter for this drive, and the pinout is drawn on the power adapter. So very convenient. Thank you, SciQuest. So we can see pins one and two are ground, pin three is five volts, and pin five is 12 volts. And that's exactly the power you get from a standard PC power supply. So what I think I'll do is I will take a spare male PC Molex power connector and solder it right onto the underside of the pins of the power connector. And this is really easy to remember. The red wire is 5 volts, the yellow wire is 12 volts, and both black wires are ground. So I just need to match up these wires with these pins and solder them on. Okay, that ought to do it. I'm just going to check continuity between these pins and the pins I expect on this power connector. Let's see, this should be ground. Yep, that's ground. There's the 5 volt pin. Yep, and the 12 volt pin. Yep, all looks good. All right, so I'm pretty confident that this should work, so I'm going to reassemble this thing. Okay, it's back together, and uh, I had to cut away a little bit of the plastic down here to let this pigtail pass through, but I think this looks pretty good. And if this works, I'll be able to use a PC power supply with this, or if I ever find the original power adapter for this thing, I'll be able to use that too. So now I've got this drive connected to my workstation. Here's my parallel cable, and I've got it hooked up to power, but it looks like this drive has its own power switch over here, which I'm not gonna power on yet, because before I do that, I need drivers. I was able to find drivers on the web that should supposedly work with Windows NT 4. So I went ahead and made an image of Windows NT that should boot on this workstation, copy the drivers onto this, and there's a second partition on this disk that uh, I'll use for dumping the contents of the cartridges onto, if we're lucky. So let's boot into this. So, looks like this driver has a readme, and it says, click the settings button, go to control panel, and double click on the SCSI adapters icon. SCSI adapters. Oh, I see. I think I see what this is trying to do. This driver is going to install itself as a SCSI adapter. It's going to fool Windows into thinking it's a SCSI adapter, but it'll just pass the SCSI instructions through the parallel port. I get it. All right, I'll just add a SCSI adapter and have disk. All right, and there's our driver. Okay, do you want to restart your computer? What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to shut down the computer instead of restarting. And while I have this shut down, I'm going to turn on the power button on this drive itself here so that when I power this back on, this drive should power on and we'll see if Windows NT detects it or what happens. So let's try powering this on. Oh, we have a power LED there on the drive. That's a good sign. Okay. The drive doesn't seem to be doing anything right now. I mean, I wouldn't really expect it to without a cartridge inserted into there, but the power LED is a good sign. Okay, let's just see if this is working. Aha, uh -huh, very interesting. So we have an entry for a removable disk a D drive 
that is a removable disc. That's kind of encouraging. So the driver is definitely working. It's making Windows believe that there's a removable disc. I'm not going to try clicking on this yet because I didn't insert a cartridge in here. Uh, I think I could try this now. I think it may be time for the moment of truth. I'm going to take one of these cartridges and I'm going to try inserting it. So here we go. This door opens like that and I've never done this before. I'm going to try this very, very gently. Okay, I don't know how much force I should be using to push this in. Oh boy. All right, let's try this. Here goes nothing. Close that door. Oh, it's spinning up. It's doing something. You hear that? That's encouraging. I'm hearing hard drive sounds. Yeah, I was definitely making sounds like a real hard drive. And that is spinning, and it stopped making hard drive head sounds. Quite a bit of vibration I'm feeling from this. I hope that's okay. I think this is stable. I think this has spun up, and oh boy. Okay, let's try going here and see what happens when I click on removable disk. Hmm, D is not accessible, does not recognize, does not contain a recognized file system. Okay. Let's try, I don't know, clicking on it again. Oh, hold on. <laughs> this was working. It works. I clicked on it again and it gave me a directory of the disk. This is, this is reading from the disk. That's it. What? Okay, it didn't work the first time I clicked it, but the second time I clicked on it, it just gave me a directory listing. Uh, okay. I guess this is working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is just working. Uh, okay. Can I get the properties of this disk? Wow, yeah, it's showing one gigabyte of capacity. There's used space, free space. It's got a volume label. It's got the Spark V3 underscore 54, some kind of version number. Uh, this is working. Let's see, there's some kind of log files on here. Yep, it's reading the contents of the files and I can hear the sounds of the heads when I read these files. Uh-huh, yep. Okay. Well, I have to say, this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. I, I think what I'll do now, while I have this running, as long as I have it running, I'm just gonna select all files and uh, copy everything over to my data partition on my hard drive. Well, actually, in fact, I'm gonna create a, a folder for each of these cartridges, because there are two of them, I'll create a folder called one and two. And then I will select all files from here and copy them right over to the number one folder and just get that kicked off because I don't want anything to fail, you know, in this process. I just want to get this done right away and spend as little time as possible having this spinning because this is such a fragile and old technology. I just want to get this done. But wow, yeah, this is copying. There don't seem to be any errors so far. Copying any of these files. Still quite a bit of vibration from this, I have to say. Much more vibration than a regular hard drive. I don't know if that's normal, if that's how these disks are supposed to be, or if this is a sign of imminent failure. Again, that's why I just want to do this. But I have to say, this is very encouraging and, you know, hats off to SciQuest for making it really simple to install this. Like, I literally just installed this right now in front of you and rebooted and it just worked. 
I'll try putting my microphone right up to this drive so you can hear how it sounds. I hope you'll be able to hear the vibration and maybe some high frequency whine and maybe some of the the reed head sounds from this. Okay, well that has finished copying. It's been several minutes. The transfer speed is not very high. Obviously this is happening over the parallel port, which I think the transfer speed over a parallel port is something like one megabyte per second. I could be wrong. I think it's one megabyte per second, which is kind of slow, a little sluggish. Ideally this should be done over a SCSI connection, but if you're on a tight budget, you have a parallel port, everybody has a parallel port, and this drive will work for that purpose. It was slow, but it got the job done. And I've got 800 megabytes of data copied over from this drive to my recovery partition. So now that this cartridge is done, let's try ejecting it, which should be this button here. Let's try that. Oh, it's spinning down, and... Oh, okay, that popped out a little violently there. <laughs> but... Okay, I mean, I have to say I'm pleasantly surprised, pleasantly surprised by the simplicity of this. Even though knowing full well that these are very close to failing and probably would have failed if you continue to use them for extended amounts of time, still, you know, it was kind of exhilarating to see this work again. And, whew, very glad to have the data off of this one. And, well, I'll just finish reading the second one, and I'll come back to you in a bit. So, I just finished dumping the second of the cartridges, which was basically the same. Uh, it presented no problems whatsoever. Copied all the files off of this, which is great. And now both of these are safely recovered onto my hard drive over there, which I'll go and dump onto my main workstation upstairs. Obviously, I can't show you the contents of what's actually on these discs, but it's basically just the backup of somebody's computer from 1998. And that's what these things were mostly used for as portable backup storage. But once again, these things had a really high failure rate, and I was really worried, but we're very lucky that these two cartridges are very nicely preserved, they're still readable, and our drive here is as good as new, and we were able to read the data off of these as quickly as possible, which is great. So yeah, again, this technology didn't last very long because people started experiencing all kinds of failures with it and people just stopped trusting these things. And also by the mid 2000s, we already had things like rewritable CDs, then DVDs, and also not to mention portable hard drives. So no one actually needed removable platters anymore. But anyway, I think I'm going to keep my modified PsyQuest drive here in case I come across more of these cartridges in the future. And if you have any of these discs that you'd like me to read for you, feel free to get in touch and send them over. Well, I think that'll do it for today, so thanks for watching and see you next time.